Well, good morning. Welcome to Thompson Road Baptist Church. I'll get my life here together. We're glad to see each one of you here today, and especially for our uh, spring uh, revival meetings with uh, Mark Herbster. Uh, some, most of you were, a lot of you were here for the Sunday school hour, and we're thankful for the message that we've already heard to stir our hearts towards revival. We need the Lord to revive our own hearts. And so would you stand with me as we sing the song, Revive Us Again, Asking God to Revive Us. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verse. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now God. standing please to go straight into a scripture passage the 85th psalm is based or the, that hymn is based on the 85th psalm that we just sang follow along as I read beginning in verse 6 our call to worship this morning wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee show us thy mercy O Lord and grant us thy salvation I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh unto them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. Amen. You may be seated. I pray that uh, that is your desire this morning, that uh, the Lord would use his righteousness as it's presented to us from his word this week so that he might uh, set us in the way of his steps. That's what this is about, uh, looking toward God, uh, looking toward what his desire is for us and letting him arrange our steps, letting him work in our hearts and change our lives uh, so that we can be what he wants us to be, so that we can be used how he wants us to be used, so he can change us into the image of his son so that we might be of greater glory to him, both in this life and throughout the ages. Well, we're excited about this week and thankful for each one of you that the Lord has led to be able to join us today. And for those joining us online as well, we just hope that we'll have a good chance to connect with you. So if you are uh, joining us virtually, if you'd put something in the comments to uh, let us know that uh, you've joined and uh, we'll get a chance to connect with you if you're interested in that. If you're here uh, uh, on site, and uh, this is your first time, or your first time in a long time. Uh, we want again just warmly welcome you and invite you as you leave through the rear exit here to your right as you go out. You'll notice the Welcome Center with the big words Welcome Center over that, and uh, there will be some of our members to greet you with uh, a chocolate bar to thank you for joining us as a guest, and a little card to help us get better acquainted with you if you're if you're uh, interested in, in uh, filling that out and connecting in that way. And uh, we've just been praying that the Lord would bring the people he wants here this week, that he would do uh, the work in our hearts that he wants to do. This is about 
uh, spiritual awakening. It's about uh, the Lord stirring up, uh, rekindling a fire in our souls, as the hymn lyric said that we sang a moment ago. And so uh, we come with uh, eager expectation. We come with uh, submissive hearts, open ears, open Bibles, ready to uh, see God work, ready to do our part in responding to his spirit. So let's uh, pray together and ask for God's blessing on uh, this morning's worship service and our meetings this week. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the honor and privilege of, of being able to uh, meet together in your name and for those who know you and have been added spiritually to your family to gather together as your house, as a holy temple that, that uh, we know that you are here among us. And as we sing your praise this morning, Lord, may it not be a, a ritual exercise, but may it be intentional worship uh, when we offer meaningful expressions of praise, not only in those words of song, in these uh, prayers that we offer, each one praying along, uh, the gifts that we give, the exhortation we offer to each other as we connect in fellowship, uh, and Lord, in our response to the preaching, may that be worship as we present ourselves as living sacrifices to you. Lord, we pray for some joining us this morning who uh, don't know your saving grace, who maybe don't know where uh, the next step is on their spiritual journey, maybe aren't 100% sure that their sins are forgiven and that, that they have a home in heaven someday. Lord, may this be a time of spiritual awakening for them. May you uh, help someone this week to be born again as they realize their need for a savior and uh, find the new life that only you can give, the spiritual and eternal life that is made available through the sacrifice of your son. So we praise you this morning, Lord, for your grace, for this extra opportunity uh, to uh, just devote extra time, to uh, devote extra attention uh, to seeking you and, uh, and uh, asking for your special work in our lives. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. As the Lord seeks to do a work in our hearts, it's our responsibility to respond and resolve to obey. So would you stand with me as we sing the first three verses of I Am Resolved. As we resolve in our hearts to abstain from sin, that allows the Lord to draw us nearer and nearer, which should be the desires of our hearts. We'll sing that song, the first two verses. Oh, 
Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with the steadfast hope, and will fill me lost in thee. I. Draw me be seated. Well, we want to again welcome the Herbster family who has uh, carved time out of their schedules to uh, be able to travel here to Indianapolis and be with us this week. So thankful for that. How many of you have either before today uh, met the Herbsters or heard their music or preaching? And that's uh, many of you, okay. Our teens have, have uh, heard Brother Mark at camp down at the Wilds uh, and have also I've been able to sit under his ministry at conferences and uh, the IFBF Pastors Fellowship here uh, in Indiana and uh, cross paths in some of those ways and I've always enjoyed and appreciated that. Some of their uh, music CDs are available uh, back in the lobby as you go. Uh, just a chance for you to uh, continue the work that the Spirit is doing as that plays and uh, encourages your heart and, uh, and the ministers, uh, the grace of the Lord to you in that way, I encourage you to take advantage of that. Uh, Brother Herbster led the uh, Herbster evangelistic team uh, for many years, 18 years traveling in evangelism, and it's called a team because his twin brother Mike is also an evangelist and a camp director. He mentioned in Sunday school his brother Matt, whose family uh, are now missionaries to Hong Kong, and so a uh, family that the Lord is using uh, in preaching, in teaching, in uh, music, and uh, now on a, a university campus, as uh, the Herbsters have been led to Maranatha Baptist University up in Wisconsin just a few years ago, and now being able to invest and impact in, in young lives in that way. He is the uh, dean of the College of Bible and Church Ministries and uh, serves in other uh, capacities there at Maranatha as well. So if you want to talk about education, if you want to talk about music, if you want to talk about preaching, evangelism, traveling, uh, Bible interpretation, any of those things, the Herbsters will, will uh, be great for a conversation for you. Hope you get to uh, know them a little better uh, this week as you have those opportunities to interact. Uh, Mike and his wife Amy are going to uh, come and sing, and uh, he's got a hymn to teach us as well before he opens God's Word for us this morning. down at the feet of Jesus for oh, the blessed happy day where my soul found peace in believing and my sins were all washed away let me tell the old old story of his grace so full and free let my heart keep giving him the glory for his wondrous love to me for his wondrous love to me It was down at the feet of Jesus where I found such perfect rest. Where the light first dawned on my spirit and my soul was fully blessed. Let me tell the old, old story of his grace so full and free. Let my heart keep giving him the glory for his wondrous love 
to me for his wondrous love to me. It was down at the feet of Jesus where I brought my guilt and sin that he paid my debt and forgave me for he died my soul to win let me tell the old old story of his grace so full and free let my heart keep giving him the glory for his wondrous love to me for his wondrous love to me thankful this morning for the love of God. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. And I am so thankful that this morning on this Lord's Day, we have every reason to rejoice because we have brought our guilt and shame to the cross. If you are here today and you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Jesus loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. We are hoping and praying that today might be your day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Well, I appreciate Pastor's kind uh, invitation to be here and his introduction of us this morning. Thankful to be serving alongside great men of God and known uh, Pastor Joel and Pastor Jeremy for a number of years. So thankful for them and their families and appreciate the opportunity to join forces together with them. I hope that you know that the evangelist and the pastor, we are not competitors, we are co-laborers. We are working together for the good of the ministry. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 that God has chosen the evangelist and the pastor teacher for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so I'm a different voice Maybe a little bit louder voice, I don't know. Sometimes that's typical of the evangelist. But I am saying the same things that your pastor says, preaching the word of God. And and I trust that God would use me and use our ministry with you this week, that it would encourage you and challenge you in your walk with the Lord. Pastor already mentioned we have a table in the lobby, and I hope that you'll stop by and take a look at some of the information that is there. As he also mentioned, I am serving at Maranatha Baptist University There's a lot of opportunities there for your advancing your education, for young people to come and and go to college. I'm thankful that your pastor and his wife are both graduates from Maranatha, and it's great to serve alongside of uh, some graduates that we are really, really thankful for and proud of, and I hope you'll stop by and take a look at some of the information. I'll be mentioning that throughout the week. Pastor also mentioned, I appreciate this, that he mentioned our CDs that are available back there. We're making our CDs available to you. Uh, These are CDs from the entire Herbster family. Some of you are familiar with our music through the years, my brothers and I and our family. We have our CDs available for $10 this week, any of the CDs, just $10 for each CD. Uh, If you're interested in in, in actually downloading the, the recordings, they are available online on iTunes and places like that. So you can find them in most of the digital stores. And I wanted to make sure you know that so that if you'd rather purchase it online, You can do that as well for $10 online on iTunes. But we will be there before and after the services. Love to talk to you. Love to make you aware of our ministry. But most importantly, God has brought us here to be a blessing to you and to your church. Hope we can encourage you throughout this week as we have services tonight and then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night. I know we will have some coming in by way of the live stream as well, so we welcome you to join all of the services. We are also providing a children's program on Monday and Tuesday and regular children's uh, services on Wednesday night. 
uh, just like you normally do. And so I hope that uh, you'll take advantage of all the opportunities that we have this week. One of the things that I like to do when we have our meetings is have a theme song. And I know this is going to be a brand new song to you. Um, it is in the Wild Songbook, but uh, I'm going to sing through the first verse. The lyrics will be on the screen so you can follow along. And we're going to just try it this morning, okay? You're going to learn a new song. You're going to be like the large choir here this morning, and I'm the, I'll be the director. We're going to learn a new song, okay? This is a wonderful new arrangement, new tune to an old text that I'm sure you've heard before. It's called Grace Alone. And uh, I think it's important, as you see on, on the uh, posters behind me as well, that we focus our attention on a spiritual awakening, an awakening to God, to his, to his glory, his grace, and his gospel. And it's important that when we sing songs like the one you're going to learn this week, that we truly reflect upon the grace of God in our lives. I want to sing through the first verse, and then we're just going to try it, okay? And just do the best you can, and I promise by, by Wednesday you'll have it down. And it, you don't have to worry, okay? Nobody else probably knows this song either, and so just do the best you can. See if you can uh, learn the first verse this morning. Appreciate Josh uh, playing for us this morning. And uh, listen as I sing the first verse, follow along, and then we'll in together and we'll try it together. Grace, tis a charming sound, harmonious to the ear. Heaven with the echo shall resound, and all the earth shall hear, and all the earth shall hear, say by grace alone, this is all my plea, Jesus died for all mankind. And Jesus died for me. Now, I know that you are good listeners, and what's powerful about music is it's amazing. You can hear it one time and pick up a lot, okay? I know you're not going to sing it perfectly, but let's try it, all right? Let's stand. Don't worry. We're going to sing through it a couple, a couple different times. Thank you, brother. Grace is a charming sound, harmonious truth. And with the echo shall resound, and all the earth shall hear, and all the earth shall hear. Say, my grace alone, this is all my plea, Jesus died. And Jesus died for me. Great job. We're going to sing it through just the first verse one more time. You guys did great. I think most of you picked up quite a bit on that first time through. Repetition will aid our learning, okay? I think it's really good to learn new, fresh songs like this that help to reflect upon truths that we've sung many, many times. All right, let's try it again. First verse together. Grace is a charming sound, harmonious to the ear. Heaven with the echo shall resound, and all the earth shall hear, and all the earth shall hear. Say, Jesus died for me. If you are thankful that Jesus died for you, say amen. amen. That's why we're singing these wonderful hymns. Appreciate so much your good singing this morning. Thank you so much. Seated. Take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. I will be talking throughout the week about the ministry that God has given to us, incredible ministry of investing in the next generation of college students and uh, 
pastors and teachers and so thankful for the privilege that I have to serve at Maranatha Baptist University. But for sake of time this morning, I'm going to reserve that for later throughout this week. I do want to just introduce my family, my wife Amy, who just sang with me. I'm so thankful that she has uh, been a faithful wife and traveled with me all over the world. She knew what she was getting into when she started dating me because I told her right away that I was going to be an evangelist. And uh, for most of our married life, we lived in a fifth wheel trailer. And uh, the first time we ever bought a home was in Watertown, Wisconsin, about 20 years after we got married. And uh, so you can, you can know that this is a special lady down here. I'm thankful that she's been willing to hold, out, hold on for the ride, if I can say it that way. God has given me four daughters, and God knew exactly what I needed to make me more sensitive. All these ladies in my home, I haven't, my oldest daughter is 20 years old, and uh, her name is Megan, and she is uh, a sophomore in nursing school at Maranatha, and so she's not with us here this week. My second daughter, Madison, is 18 years old, and uh, so thankful that she just started her freshman year. She's a freshman this year, and training to be an elementary school teacher at Maranatha. And then my two younger daughters are with me, and God has blessed us with Morgan and Meredith. Morgan is 11, she's right down here, and Meredith is 10, and she's right down here, and I hope you get to know them. And of course, they will be helping to populate the children's program this week, on Tuesday, or Monday and Tuesday night, that my wife will be providing, and so I hope your kids will join with them as well. He's so thankful for my family, and of course, Pastor mentioned uh, the, the Christian heritage, the godly heritage of my family. My dad was a pastor for 28 years in Kansas City, Missouri at Tri-City Ministries. Both of my brothers are in the ministry as well. My brother Matt was formerly the director of the Wilds Christian Camp and now has uh, transitioned to be a missionary in Hong Kong. Right now he is in the States because he can't go back. Uh, he, he came back for a wedding and he's hanging out for quite some time until kind of the COVID pro- protocols allow him to travel back to Hong Kong. And my brother Mike is a camp director. He's my twin brother, and he is a camp director down in uh, Ringgold, Louisiana, at Southland Christian Ministries. So God has blessed me with a family of preachers. You can imagine the conversations we have when we get together. And as Pastor told you, I like to talk about a lot of different things. I'm interested in a bunch of different things. And by the way, I am in the great state of Indiana, and I'm very interested in basketball, of course. And of course, you know that uh, March Madness is just right around the corner. You want to talk about sports? I enjoy that as well. I do enjoy talking about theology and preaching and music and traveling, and I would love to get to know you. You know, sometimes the evangelist kind of blows in and blows up and blows out, right? But that's not what we want to do. We want to spend some time with you. We want to engage in conversation with you. And I know we're still trying to be careful, of course, and all those different uh, social distancing things. But you know what? It's good to know that we're almost back to normal. Isn't that good? And uh, maybe, maybe we will get back to normal fairly soon. Look forward to chatting with you after the service this morning or in the evenings. Appreciate so much the privilege of serving together with you at this good church, Thompson Road Baptist Church. Thankful for this privilege even this morning to share the word of God with you. John chapter 4 is where we've turned in our Bibles this morning. And a very important message I hope will be an encouragement to you. If you missed the Sunday school hour, we were talking about seeking the Lord, a spiritual awakening. One of the ways that we seek the Lord is through the area of worship. It's been mentioned several times already this morning. Pastor prayed about it. We've been singing and we've been worshiping the Lord together. And typically when we talk about the idea of worship, we would categorize worship to what we do on Sunday. And what I want to say this morning and teach this morning is that worship is not just what we do on Sunday. Worship is a way of life. Worship is who we are. Worship is why God made us. And I want to show you this morning from this, starting in John chapter 4, from this incredible passage, how important that is that we view worship as our response to God, not our rituals that we perform. I want to say it again. Worship is not the rituals we perform, but worship is the response that we give to God. This is so important because even this week, we're having several services together, and we don't want to view this as, well, this is just what our church does. No, we need to go deeper. We need to have something more lasting. We need to have more of an eternal perspective on what we're doing this week. That is, we are truly bowing before the Lord. 
The word worship, specifically in the Old Testament, the word worship literally means to bow. And we do bow before him physically, but we also bow before him spiritually. And that's, that's really the focus that we're looking at here this morning. And that is that worship is our response to God, not the rituals we perform. John chapter 4 is where we want to jump from, uh, and then we'll go to several other passages this morning. In John chapter 4, we have this incredible story of the woman at the well. You probably are familiar with this story, and probably the most important part of the story is the central theme, and that is that Jesus is the living water. Can I just say this morning, if you are searching to be satisfied... Anywhere other than the Savior, Jesus Christ, you will be sorely disappointed. So Jesus takes the opportunity in a very illustrative way, in a very picturesque way, he takes the opportunity to use the well and the water in the well to describe to this woman what actually occurs when somebody gets saved. And he says that when you drink of me, Jesus said, you will never thirst again. There is probably somebody here this morning or somebody listening online and you have an emptiness, you have a dissatisfaction in your life right now and maybe you're searching to fill that uh, through finances, material things, through pleasure, through friendships or other relationships. Well, I want to say to you what Jesus said. You'll never thirst when you drink of him, which means if you will come to Christ, come to Jesus and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will have a life that is completely and utterly satisfied in Jesus Christ alone. Many of us have already experienced that. We have literally experienced what this woman was being taught by Jesus. Do you remember the time you got saved? Do you remember the emptiness that was there before? Do you remember how Christ is is, is clearly satisfying your life? And that's exactly what Jesus told this woman. So the central theme of the story really is the gospel. And if you're without the gospel, you need to believe. You need to trust in Jesus Christ, and today could be your day of salvation. But it's interesting that while Jesus is communicating the gospel in a clear, picturesque way, this woman has some serious barriers, some questions that needed to be answered for her to believe the gospel. Now, I'm sure this has occurred for many of you. It has occurred to me many times As I'm sharing the gospel in a very simple way to someone, I notice there's something blinding them. There is something that is is like a barrier to belief in their life. And and often it is false religion. How many of you have experienced this with someone? Anybody? And maybe they have some serious questions about God, whether God exists. Or maybe they have questions about Christianity or the essence of Christianity or the history of Christianity. Or maybe they believe in a cult or some false philosophy and And they have questions that need to be answered. I I do think it's important for me to say that we need to take time to answer their questions. So that they can have their eyes open to the truth of the gospel. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give an answer. Well, Jesus gives us a great example of that here in this text. Because while he's sharing the gospel, this Samaritan woman, who was radically different from the Jewish people, they, we, we know that there was a distinct division and there, they, there, was this, there wasn't a friendship between the Jews and the Samaritans. There was always problems between these two groups. But they also had different ways of worship. They had different places of worship. And this was the specific issue that needed to be dealt with for her to believe. And so in verse 19 is where we want to pick up the story. And, and she raises the issue of worship. She raises a question to Jesus that she needed to have answered. Verse 19, the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So Mount Gerizim is the idea of the mountain where the Samaritans would worship, and of course the Jews worshiped in Jerusalem. And here's a lady that cannot possibly understand how Jesus is the living water until she figures out, why are you worshiping there and we're worshiping here? And in some ways, probably worshiping in different ways, maybe even worshiping a different person. And we could read about this all the way back into the Old Testament stories of the Samaritans and the Jews. And there was a division. There, there There was this 
uh, this animosity towards one another. And so in order for her to understand the gospel, Jesus has to give one of the clearest statements on worship in all of the Bible. Verse 21. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Simple principle from verse 21, and that is worship is not about the place. Worship is about the person. And can I say for us living in this century, living in our time period, and even meeting together in this building today, worship is not about the place. Worship is about the person. And it's not just other religions that struggle with this. It's not just other churches that struggle with this. We struggle with this. And we tend to compartmentalize our worship to what we do on Sunday when we go to the church and when we attend the worship service. This is worship, but this is not exclusively the only time we worship the Lord. And it's really not about the facility or the place. It's about the person of Jesus Christ. Verse 22, Jesus goes on and he says, you worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Now, I'm going a little bit quickly through this. There's, there's a longer, longer truth and, and longer teaching here, but in verse 22, basically, he's saying you can't worship somebody you don't know. You can't worship somebody you don't know. And I think this is happening all across America. There's a lot of people who do their religious duty, they do the Christian service of going to a, 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 a meeting or going to a church building, but many of them don't even know who they're worshiping. They don't even know their God. And so understanding of God, understanding of the truth of Jesus Christ brings clarity to our worship. Let's keep reading verse 23. We're, try, we're trying to get to something very important here in just a moment. Verse 23. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers Notice that phrase, true worshipers, which insinuates that there are false worshipers. The true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So obviously, uh, he repeats it twice. We worship God in spirit and in truth. But notice the end of verse 23. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. This is so important that we recognize that even on this Lord's Day, as a worshiper of God, that God is looking down upon this congregation and he is pleased with and he is looking for true worshipers. So the obvious question is this. Are we in that category? Are you in that category today? Are you a true worshiper? And what I want to do for the rest of our time together is is answer that question. How do we know if we're a true worshiper? Well, well, true worship is not ritual, it's response. It's the intellectual, emotional, and volitional response that we give to the excellence of God, to his glory, to his grace, to his gospel. And we are responding to that truth in certain ways. And what I believe the scripture shows is the scripture shows that true worshipers will have certain responses coming out of their life. Not just on Sunday, but every day. So turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. This is so important that we, we acknowledge that this is what God is looking for. I want to say very clearly, God is not looking for just church attendance. God is not just looking for giving our tithes and offerings. God is not just looking for us to come and sing all the songs just like everybody else in the church is doing. God wants us to be having a genuine response to him. And I would say that all those forms that I just mentioned, which are a part of our regular worship services, all of those mean nothing. They literally mean nothing to God unless they are connected to a heart response. Rituals are not bad. We do rituals. We, we are, in a sense, carrying on a, a worship ritual even here this morning because how many of you were here last Sunday? In the Sunday before? In the Sunday before? Seems like we're doing something pretty 
uh, pretty ritualistic. In other words, the, the idea of a ritual is a pattern. It's something that you're repeating. It's something that you're doing regularly. Rituals are not bad, but they mean nothing if they're not connected to a genuine, deep heart response. And we know this because the scripture reminds us even when we give our offerings, if we're not doing it with a right heart, then it's not really the kind of offering God's looking for. And if we're singing the songs, I've heard one person say, God's name is taken in vain behind the hymn book more than anywhere else. Because we sing songs and we don't even think about what we're singing. There's no real heart engagement, heart response. And so I think this is really important as we approach even the times that we meet together this week, that, that our hearts and minds and our will will be engaged in what we are doing so that we are actually responding to the truth in the right way. We need to be responding to the truth in this way. And so if I can say in a, in a very simple definition, worship is responding to the truth. Responding to the truth. And as you see on the posters, the truth of God's glory God's grace, and God's gospel. And it is his. It belongs to him. It's really all about God, and when we worship the Lord, we bow before him by responding in these ways. What kind of response are you giving? And the question needs to be asked, are we true worshipers? Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, help us to see the first two responses out of four that we want to look at today. Now, each of the each of the passages we're going to look at, we're going to look at three texts. And I want you to see the significance and the similarities between these texts. Each of these passages will have a lengthy section of doctrine or theology, followed by a very simple, straightforward statement of response or application. And Romans 12 is the classic example because the entire book is built in this pattern. Eleven chapters of theology, and then the rest of the book, just a few chapters of practical application, and the transitional statement is found here in Romans 12. Now, I know this is not very profound, but Romans 12 follows Romans 1 through 11. Okay? And we need to remember that, because sometimes we go to this text, and we extrapolate it out, and we don't really connect it to what has already been said, and what has already been said is all of the theology of salvation. The entire Romans road is in Romans 1 through 11, right? Could you quote some of those verses? There's so much talk about, about our justification, about our redemption, about being sanctified, and allowing the Spirit to illuminate us through the power of the gospel, and then even talk about glorification and all of the salvation theology. And we have verses like, Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Question, does that truth impact your life? Does the truth of redemption and justification and sanctification, the power of the gospel, is it reaching your soul today? Do you realize it's, it's not enough to just preach the gospel to unsaved people. We need to hear the gospel. You need to hear the gospel as a Christian. Why? Because when you understand the depth of what you have received, the riches of his grace, there is a response. And this response I'm submitting to you is worship. This is how we worship God. Do you realize Romans 12, 1 and 2, I could say, Romans 12, 1 and 2 are clearly worship verses. And we know that because one of the words that is used in verse 1 is a word that is typically translated worship in, in the New Testament. It's the word from which we get the English word liturgy. It's the last word of verse 1, the word service. And so some have said that we could, we could read into this verse, verse 1, which is, your, which is your logical or reasonable response of worship is the idea. In service is worship, and we'll talk about that. But notice verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by or because of the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Remember, which is your logical act of worship, is the idea of the language there. 
So verse 1 helps us to see that a true worshiper will respond to God in this way. Number one, a true worshiper, a true worshiper will surrender their life. This is what real worship is. This is what God accepts in spirit and in truth. It's when we are so overwhelmed with the truth of the gospel that we say, my life is not my own. Because I've been bought with a price. And I glorify God in my body and my spirit, which are his. And so in verse 1, he says that we present. It's a, it's a literal choice that we make. A dedication to choice. We present our bodies a living sacrifice. Notice the word sacrifice. If he's willing to sacrifice for us, we are willing to sacrifice back. And we sacrifice with our lives. The word living is an interesting word because all the sacrifices of the Old Testament were dead, but now the sacrifices in the New Testament for us as believers are no longer dead animals, but now we have the privilege of every day a life and the choices of our life and the lifestyle that we live. All of that is a way of sacrificing for what he did for us. So it's a living sacrifice. Notice it's holy. That's, that means it's pure and set apart for God, set apart from sin, set apart to God. It's a priority in our lives. Notice he says it's acceptable unto God. This is what God is looking for. Just as we saw in John chapter 4, the Father is looking for true worship. This is acceptable to God. Can I just say it is not acceptable to God to do all the Christian duties on Sunday and on the religious services and yet live a life throughout the week that is not yielded to him, that is not acceptable to God. And I think it's important that we say what the text says. True worship is when we surrender our lives. And it could be possible today that there are people even sitting before me who put on their nice clothes today and came to church and sang the songs and maybe even are going through the forms of this worship service and yet you know there is something that is binding your life. There is an idol. There is a sin. There is a temptation. There is, there, is, there is something going on in your life that is causing you really not to be surrendered to the Lord. What is real worship? What is God looking for? Can I ask you this morning, is there an idol that needs to be cast out? The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. That means if there's anything else that's first place... That's an idol. And whatever is on the throne is, is, what is what you are really worshiping. Whatever is on the throne is what is determining the choices of your living and your lifestyle. Is there a sin that is dominating? Is there a sin that is really plaguing your life that is basically taking over God's place in your life that needs to be confessed? You're not really this holy, living sacrifice before the Lord. So you see the connection here. The connection is true worship is not just what we do on Sunday. It, and let's, let's face it. It's easy to do the corporate worship on Sunday, but it's difficult to live for God throughout the week. And it's really important that we recognize that true worship is not ritual. It is response. The deep, heartfelt response of a Christian to, to who God is and what God has done for us. This is the kind of sacrifice that God is looking for. And this is the kind of sacrifice I'm calling for in this message. I'm exhorting you to think about worship differently. And, and you realize, if you are a person that is living a surrendered life every day, that when you come to church on Sunday, this would be the overflow. This would be the overflow of what's already happening in your life. And which is why it should be energized, which is why it should be exciting. It's not exciting because we have exciting music. It's not exciting because we have, you know, necessarily just a, a fantastic facility or, or packed out pews. It should be exciting because we know in whom we have believed. And throughout the week, we're worshiping God by sacrificing our lives. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God, and you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. You know what this means? Every decision of our living matters. It matters because it's either showing that we are worshiping God or it's showing that we're living for ourselves. 
our lifestyle and our living and the choices that we're making show whether we're surrendered to the Lord. So I'm calling you to be a true worshiper. A true worshiper is the only kind of worshiper that pleases God. Is that describing you this morning? There's a second response we see here right in verse 2. Notice verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. And I do believe all of this is connected, again, to responding to the truth. If God has saved you, he has snatched you from the miry pit and set your feet on a solid rock. He has taken you from the power of Satan unto God. Then there should be a response to his truth, a response to his gospel. And that is, verse 2, a separation from the world. This is the second response that we, we see in true worshipers. A true worshiper is surrendered, surrendering their life. Number two, separating from the world. Now, I think it is important that we talk about separation. And I'm thankful that, that this church historically has been a separated church. You ought to be thankful for that. That's a good thing. Maybe you don't even know what that means, what I just said. Well, basically, to summarize, a separated church just simply means that when it comes to associations, when it comes to different connections with other uh, Christian groups and Christian ministers, that this church is very careful that they don't entertain or allow any false teaching in those connections, in those, in, in, in those people. And so the church has decided that they're going to stand for God on, on, tr- on true theology, right theology. And you ought to be thankful for that because a church should not allow false teaching. And a church should be careful that they're not connecting themselves with organizations and groups that are allowing false teaching. That is very, very important. The scripture teaches that. But I want to tell you that most, most of the teaching in the Bible that is on separation is not about your church being separated. Most of the teaching in the Bible on separation is about you and me being separated. It's about personal separation. And this is one of those passages. You can't get around this. It says, do not be conformed to the world. And remember, it's in response to the gospel. By the mercies of God, we do this. Because of what God's grace has done for us, we are to not be conformed to the world. And it's interesting that the word conformed here literally means externally. In other words, I could say it like this. If you are really a saint, you ought to look like one. If you really are a saint, you ought to act like one. And you know what? Sad to say, there's an entire teaching in the Christian community today that says we're to be like the world in order to win the world. That is nowhere to be found in the Bible. The Bible says friendship with the world is enmity with God. It says love not the world. It says we're to be crucified unto the world. Listen, we are to be distinct, God's special people, a peculiar people zealous of good works. And the question is, is that showing up in our life? Listen, I know that people might think that we're distinct because we go to church, but the reality is they need to see the distinction throughout the week. They need to hear it in our voice. They need to watch it in our families. They need to uh, see it in our marriages. And they need to see it in in the way we handle ourselves at work and the way we entertain ourselves and all those things. We are to not be pressed into the mold of the world. And this idea is, is clearly not It's not speaking of the world as as the globe or the earth or the dirt or the trees or the animals. We're talking about the world's system, the system of this age, the spirit of this age. And it's all around us. It's humanistic. It's materialistic. It's hedonistic. It's postmodern. It's even atheistic. There's all kinds of false teachings and false philosophies. They're categorized in 1 John 2, the lust of the flesh, or the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's living for pleasure. That's hedonism. It's living for material possessions. That's materialism. It's living for pride and your own popularity. That's humanism. And those are just some of the categories that, that we see all around us. And he's saying that every day we need to be fighting against the world. And why should we do this? Why should we make a distinction in our personal life, in our families, in our churches? Why should we be distinct from the world? I'm telling you, it's because God is worthy. And the, one of the ways that we bow before him in our lifestyle, one of the ways we bow before him in our families, is we choose not to be like the world. Not conform to the world. And so this is a response that needs to be in our lives. And so it's important that I, I say this this morning. It's possible that you look different today than the world. But throughout the week, nobody would even know that you're a true believer. That's sad. 
And that's the reality in a lot of Christians' lives. And I'm just saying that God doesn't accept that kind of formalistic, ritualistic, religious worship where we just kind of clean up ourselves so everybody knows that we're doing our church thing. But the rest of the week, we're really in the world and of the world. True worship is not the rituals we perform. It is the response that we give. And can I say, when we do come to God's house, it should be otherworldly, if I can say it that way. It should be heavenly. Which is why we ought to be careful with how we worship God corporately because people that are unsaved and living in the world, when they come to our churches, they ought to scratch their heads and go, wow, that's different. Yeah, it should be. They shouldn't be like, that's just like what, you know, that's just how we entertain ourselves at home. That's the same sounds of the world. I don't see any difference there. If they don't see any difference, then there's probably not much difference. But I'm, I'm just saying also in our personal lives, it is so important that we are showing in everything we're doing in life that we are pilgrims. And we are. We look for a city whose builder and maker is God. Our home is heaven. That's where we're going. We're citizens of heaven which means we don't cling on tightly and we don't become friends of the world. And, and this is so important that we're, that we're proving this in our lives, personally, in our families, in our churches, that all of this is a way that we worship God. His truth demands a separation, a separation from the world. All right, so number one is sacrificing and surrendering your life. Number two is separating from the world. All right, we need to go quickly to another passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. All right, just, just to remind you, we're, we're looking at this simple truth. Worship, true worship to God is not ritual, it's response. It's the intellectual, emotional, volitional response of a believer to the truth of God. And when the truth of God is deeply meaningful to you, these responses will come out. Can I just add in something here? It is really a shame that a lot of what I'm talking about is not seen in the Christian community much anymore. And you know what that tells me? It tells me not just that we're not maybe fo- that, that we're false worshipers, but it tells me that actually a lot of Christians don't deeply think about the truth much. And when the truth is resting inconsequential on our hearts, we will not be responding in this way. So the more of the, God's truth that we can have, the better it is, because the deeper we go, the more of these kinds of responses we will see. And we'll recognize what God is doing in our lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Notice what the Bible says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 17. Again, remember, this is the second passage that has a little bit lengthier section on the specific theology. And then one simple statement of response. In this case, we don't have chapters, we just have verses. Verses 17 through 21 uh, are arguably one of the greatest passages in all the Bible about a specific theological term... In teaching, and that is the idea of reconciliation. You're going to see that word many times as we read these verses. And the term reconciliation is a very specific theology that takes place the moment we get saved. We are taken from enmity and brought into friendship. There is no peace with God for the wicked, but there is peace with God through Jesus Christ. Now, there is an entire message, an entire teaching that could we could talk about with this idea of reconciliation. It literally means an exchange of status. God has exchanged our status. We are no longer his enemies. We are his friends. That is one of the most beautiful salvation terms in salvation theologies. And what I'm, what I'm trying to show you is when you understand what God has done in his reconciliation, there will be a response. Notice Notice these verses, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And all things are of God, and he, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Notice how many times he uses the word reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and had committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And then skip verse 20. We'll look at that in a second. Look at verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. One of the greatest passages of salvation right there, verse 21. Now, verse 20 is the response. Lots of talk about this theology. And the point is this, if you really understand what you have received, if the truth is impacting your life, 
Look what he says in verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. This is the response statement. Simple statement of response. That you are not here to represent yourself. You are here to represent God. And notice how he says this. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. This is a passage talking about every Christian who understands the the change that has happened in their life, the new creation, the exchange of status. Every Christian that understands that will will be wanting to talk about that to other people and they'll realize they're here to represent Christ. I love talking about this because I'm an evangelist. And the word evangelist literally means gospel messenger. And I want to say to you this morning, one of the best ways to worship God is to tell his story. And if you're not telling his story, then you're really not worshiping him the way you ought to. This is a response to the gospel. In response to the fact that you have been saved, he says you're an ambassador. An ambassador is someone who is representing the sovereign in an imperial province. It's like we hear about this when we say we have an ambassador to Iraq or an ambassador to some other country. And we know that that ambassador is there to speak on behalf of the king. They're not there to do their own thing. There is a specific responsibility that we have while we're left here in this imperial place called the earth, which is at war with our king. And we are not here to do our own thing and represent our own causes. We are an ambassador. We're here to represent Christ. And one of the ways that we do that is what he says very specifically here, that we literally plead with people and beg people that they would understand the gospel. It's talking about witnessing. And and folks, I have found in my life that even this this passage and others like it have encouraged me to get my eyes away from thinking about witnessing as the Christian duty that everybody does. Well, let's do our witnessing. Let's do our soul winning time because that's what's expected of us. We should not be witnessing out of expectation or out of guilt. We should be witnessing because it's worship. It's the way we respond to God. We respond to his truth by sharing Christ. And I I think that this will help to remove some of the fear that comes in when you're passing out a track to somebody that you've never met or when you're actually talking to them or asking them about their faith. And you know what I found? I found that people, I think people today really don't mind if you ask them questions, if you show love to them and you show kindness to them and you give them a gospel track. Every once in a while, you're going to get somebody that, that that is angry about that. But the majority of people that I talk to, they don't mind. They're actually expecting you to share your faith. They're actually wanting you to ask questions. Be careful. Speak the truth in love. But we have to speak the truth. And and the reason we speak the truth is because we are responding to what God has done for us. We're true worshipers. And true worshipers share the gospel. All right? So question. When was the last time you shared Christ with someone? When was the last time you gave a gospel track? When was the last time you asked some very specific questions about what they believe. You know, God has given every one of us a mission field. Your neighborhood, your workplace, your family. I'm not even talking about necessarily reaching out to people you've never met. Folks, we ought to be reaching the people we've already met. And sometimes we're just so fearful. And I think that this will help us when we, when we view our witnessing as a response of worship. We respond to God and his and his truth by witnessing, by sharing the gospel. This is response number three. Number one, surrender your life. Number two, separate from the world. Number three, share the gospel. Finally, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We gotta quickly move here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And notice the final response in this great chapter. Remember, we're looking at three texts that have a lot to talk about theology and a little application. And this is one of them. This is the resurrection chapter. Is that pretty significant? The resurrection is very significant. Paul even says it in this chapter. He says, if Jesus is not alive, then our preaching and our teaching and our ministries are in vain. We're doing empty things here this morning if Jesus is dead. But Jesus is not like Buddha or Muhammad who died and is still in the grave. Jesus is alive. And we know that because it says in verse 20, but now is Christ risen. Folks, this has got to excite us as believers, not just on Easter, but on every Lord's Day and and throughout our lives, is that we serve a Savior who conquered death. 
And because of that, it has great implications, amazing, miraculous implications for our lives. Not only our lives now, but as he says at the end of this chapter, how about our future? And when we're changed and we're made incorruptible and we go to be with God, it gives us great hope, especially when we lose a loved one, a Christian loved one. Blessed in the sight of the Lord is all of his saints. It's the death of his saints. And so we know that when they die, it's really not death. It's triumph. It's victory. Why? Because of the resurrection. And yet we can just, in some cases, just casually reflect upon the resurrection and it doesn't do anything for us. Really? True worship is responding to this, the theology of the resurrection. It's a historic event with great theological implications and it's amazing that Jesus did this for us. And we come to the end of this chapter and he gives us two verses of application and response. And what I'm saying is this is worship. All right, are you following the logic here? Our response to the truth is worship. And this is worship. This is how we worship God. Number four, we serve the Lord. We serve the Lord. So we surrender our lives, we separate from the world, we share the gospel, and we serve the Lord. He says in verse 58, therefore, the word therefore is, is, is clearly connecting to the previous verses. I, I believe verse 57 is also a response of emotion, of gratitude. Thanks be to God uh, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. But verse 58, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. It's work. It's hard. It's laborious. You don't get thanked. Sometimes you don't see the response. It's work. But it's worth it. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, I have found in my life and my ministry probably something that most of you have found out already. If you are serving God for any other reason, you will quit. This is why a lot of people have quit. The verse gives a hint of this. People quit. He has to tell us to be steadfast because we're not naturally steadfast. We are lazy and we quit. And sometimes people quit because they feel like, uh, they feel like what they're doing is not making any difference. Maybe you feel that way in some ministry here at the church. Maybe you feel like what you're doing makes no difference. And maybe you feel that way because nobody sees it or nobody recognizes it. Or maybe, maybe you just, in a general sense, think it's, it's too minor. Nobody cares. And yet he tells us here, no, your labor is not in vain. Or maybe you've quit because, because maybe even worse, not, not only uh, do, you, do you think it's not significant, but maybe you're quitting because nobody is recognizing you. You know, this is very dangerous, very dangerous for someone in ministry that we would actually serve God so that other people see us and recognize us. You know what? I'm going to tell you, if that's how you're serving, you're not serving God. You're not. You're serving yourself. And if you are expecting people to love you and you're expecting people to serve you back and you're expecting people to recognize you and that's why you're serving, then you're not going to make it because you know what? There's a lot of things we do where we're never recognized, but we're not doing it to be recognized. We're doing it for who? We're doing it for God. And I have found that that's the only thing, literally the only thing that will keep me in the ministry. And that is I'm serving because Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. And so I'm, I'm going to be steadfast. I'm going to work hard at it. I'm going to give my all at it. And you know what? It doesn't matter how people respond. It doesn't matter how everybody notices me. It's, it's really all for him. It's all for his glory because Jesus is alive. Does this make sense? I hope it does. And we're, we're to be serving the Lord in this way. So question, do you have a place of service? I promise you, if you came to pastor and you said, Pastor, I want to serve the Lord here at this church, I believe I have some, some tools and gifts that can be used. I promise you, pastor's not going to say, we're all full. We don't need you. He's probably waiting for you to volunteer. There's lots of places you can serve. And you know what? We ought to serve because it's worship. God is worthy. Okay, so simple truth this morning, but I hope with some profound application for our lives. 
We don't want to go through the motions of worship. Just attend church. Just do our duty. Just compartmentalize our worship. That's what I do on Sunday. No. Worship is who we are. Worship is a way of life. Worship is the choices you're making on Monday through Saturday as well. When we surrender our life, when we separate from the world, when we share the gospel, and when we serve the Lord. And I'm saying to you this morning, this is what God is really looking for. As we saw in John chapter 4, that is what pleases God. The Father is looking for true worship. So let's make sure that he finds us faithful. Let's make sure that we're in that category. Are you a false worshiper this morning? Without the surrender and the separation and the sharing and the serving. You're here, but it's possible to be here and not be a true worshiper. What needs to change in your life so that you can worship God in this way? If you're here without Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's the first step. You really can't properly bow before God until you accept him as your Lord and Savior. And so I would plead with you to to be saved today. For you as a Christian, maybe there's something that needs to change. Maybe you just need a, need a change of focus on worship for you here today. Maybe, maybe a profound, deep moving of the truth in your life that moves you to do these things. Maybe there's a separation from the world or sin that needs to happen. By God's grace, even this week, he will be able to look down upon this congregation, upon each of us, and say, you know what? There's a true worshiper. There is someone who is separating from the world, Surrendering their life, sharing the gospel, serving the Lord, all as a result of what they think about the truth that I've given to them. You see, the spiritual awakening, the God's glory, God's grace, and God's gospel will make us into this kind of true worship, true worshiper. God, help us to this end. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, I pray this morning that you would do a work in our hearts. Spirit of God, move across this auditorium. Lord, there are people here today who have become formalistic and maybe even uh, just complacent in their worship and maybe even hypocritical by doing everything they need to do on the Lord's Day or on worship service days, but knowing full well that down deep in their life there is not, there are not these kind of responses coming out. I pray that you would change us by your grace this morning. In this time of meditation and invitation, Lord, do your work. Awaken our hearts to these simple truths. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Would you just do that this morning? In just a moment, I'm going to ask Josh to just begin to play our song of invitation. And and, and here's what I want to do. I want you to respond however you would like to respond. We talked about responding, right? Truth has been presented. We must respond. Sometimes people like to respond by coming and kneeling and praying. I would invite you to do that. If God is moving you to do that, you come and and pray here at the front if you'd like to make a decision for the Lord. If you're here without Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have never truly been saved. You're not really a true worshiper yet. Pastor's available. He would love to talk with you. We'll get somebody to help you this morning. Make sure that you are on your way to heaven. Please don't stand idly by. If you are unsaved, you you are needing the gospel today. Why don't you come and just meet the pastor here at the front? Uh, one of the reasons why we will bow our heads is so that nobody feels embarrassed. Nobody, uh, nobody will uh, feel out of place if they need to move. But another reason we bow our heads is because we need to pray. We need to ask God to do a work in our hearts. You can respond right where you are. You can respond by coming to the front. You can respond in making a decision for the Lord. It is not necessarily how you obey or the method you use. It is that you must obey. You must obey the truth. Because what you have heard is from God. It's from his word. So let's respond in that way. Pastors available, if you need to talk, if you need help from the word of God this morning, you come. Right now, Josh is going to begin to play. Take a moment to make a decision in your heart. If you need to come, you come. God's speaking to your heart today. If you're here without Christ, we would love to help you. Why don't you just step out right now and come to the front and we'll go to a quiet place. Somebody will take a Bible and and make sure you know for sure you're on your way to heaven. If you are a Christian, ask God to make you into that true worshiper that you should be.
He's going to play just one more verse. I think it's important that we take time, be still, and know that he's God. Don't waste this moment. Make a decision for the Lord. probably a fairly familiar song for us with our heads bowed if you know it just sing it along with me search me O god just the first verse search me O god and know my heart today try me O savior know my thoughts I pray, see if there be some wicked way in me, cleanse me from every sin and sin. Lord, thank you so much for speaking to our hearts this morning. Pray that you would continue to take your word and deeply root it in our lives. Lord, I pray once again that you would guard our hearts from forsaking your truth. This is not man's idea. This is not man's written word. This is the holy word and truth of God. We must be doers of the word and not hearers only. Help us not to deceive ourselves by thinking that because we were here today, we're all okay. No, Lord, we need to leave here today and do what we have heard. And I pray that you would apply your word to our lives and continue to bless us as we go throughout this time of meetings. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Jeremy, you come. Well, thank you. Amen. What a, what a wonderful challenge from God's Word from Brother Mark. And, of course, we look forward to hearing uh, the preaching of God's Word for the rest of the week. Uh, we have our services tonight at 6 p.m. Hope you can uh, join us in return uh, for that service. And then, of course, uh, 7 p.m. for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Looking forward to what God's going to do uh, in my heart, and I trust in your heart as well. Uh, before our 6 p.m. service, we do have a 515 large ensemble uh, music rehearsal, so I trust that those of you who are part of that group can make it for that. And then uh, we have an opportunity for service. Uh, for those of you who have, are part of our screened uh, nursery workers, we have one more slot available. I believe it's a Tuesday slot that we need. Monday, correction. Uh, Monday slot available. We need one more uh, nursery worker. If you're at all able to help out with that, uh, please uh, sign up in the back. And then we have a couple weeks from now, we have our business meeting, a quarterly business meeting at the end of the month. Uh, so you can make plans to attend after that. That night, actually, Archie Perez, our missionary, will be here with us. Looking forward to hearing him speak as well. And as you come and are encouraged and blessed by the ministry of the Herbsters, if Again, uh, stop by their table in the back and see uh, the various things they have. Uh, if you would like to uh, donate a gift to them, uh, you can just write a designated gift on uh, an amount uh, or whatever on uh, our giving envelopes. Uh, all that will go above and beyond uh, the honorarium we're already giving them. So we want to make sure that we're a blessing and uh, uh, making sure we're taking care of the man of the, the, man of the Lord who is faithfully preaching his word. Thank you so much for coming, especially if this is your first time visiting with us today. Don't uh, get away before we can uh, say hi to you and greet you. We're thankful to have you as well as all our regular folk. Uh, let's close by singing Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow, and then you'll be dismissed. Mm -hmm.